leadership really I think is about understanding that really you're there to make sure everybody brings their A game and comes together and, and set the vision and so it's just sort of taking a step out of and away from the task in hand and bringing in all the context and making sure you're the one who's got the eye on the context and is making sure that we're not busy fools. Hello and welcome to the Ben Morton Leadership Podcast. It's the weekly show that brings you inspiring interviews with senior leaders and genuine subject matter experts, all designed to help you be the very best leader that you can possibly be. And the best part of all, it's completely free. In this episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with Philippa McNamara, a seasoned business leader renowned for her commercial acumen, marketing expertise and brand leadership in both retail and wholesale sectors. Philippa is a dynamic change agent with a portfolio spanning business startups, brand management, product development, B2C and B2B sales and marketing, sourcing and distribution. She boasts a wealth of experience as an executive and non-executive director with a unique role as the governor of a prestigious independent day school that transitioned to co-education after 500 years, where she serves as the very first woman chair of the school committee. Philippa's leadership journey includes her current role as the founding director of KIN, a part of the Wilco group of companies. At Kin, she spearheads transformative initiatives leading product development to help hardworking families enhance their homes and gardens using sustainable products crafted by an in-house team of award-winning product designers. That's it by way of an introduction. I'm going to keep the intro tight today and let the episode do the talking. So, Let's dive right in and please enjoy my conversation with Philippa McNamara. Philippa, a very warm welcome to the show. First of all, how are you today? Thank you. I'm good. A bit warm. I'm not going to lie. It's very humid today, but I'm feeling good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. It's been a very good week. Yeah. Good, good. And it's Friday. And it's Friday as we're recording. Absolutely. Yeah. Philippa, let's dive straight in and sort of get a bit of context, actually. So can you tell us a little bit about your your current job, what you're doing right now, and I guess the the career journey that got you to where where you are? So currently, I am the MD of a small product development um, wholesale business called Kin, and that's part of the Wilco group of companies. We, two or three years ago, had these great team of product designers who designed products bespoke for the retailer and realised that actually there's a far greater market of of, uh, consumers out there to give access to those unique products. So we basically built a business around those assets. And gosh, we've probably got a team of over 20 now, uh, focused very much on the home and garden um, product. So we really get into people's lives, find out what jobs they're trying to do, how we can do that better for them. And then we um, produce products and we've got a couple of brands, Clever Pots and Store in Order, and we have them available throughout the country and abroad. If I go right back, I started life, actually, I did a pharmacy degree and started life as a pharmacist. So bit of a pivot. But I went to work for Boots and was at Boots for very many years. And I think what I found was even though pharmacy wasn't for me as a profession, I loved the people. I loved engaging with customers. And if you think about what a pharmacist does a lot of the time over the counter, people come in with a problem and you help them solve that problem. And you meet people all day and sometimes they come back and it's really lovely to see how life has improved for them. So that really got me into retail, it got me into products and it got me into people. And between then and now, I've done a huge number of jobs. I've done lots of retail management. I've done category management, of cosmetics, fragrance, hair care. I've developed brands because that's the the sort of next move on when you get really into what people's needs are. You can then 
create brands that become famous for satisfying those needs. And I've had my own consultancy. And I'm sure I've forgotten something in between. <laughs> what was the first job at Boots that took you out of being sort of a practicing pharmacist then? What was that first transition role? So the first transition role was, was into management. So store management, where I, first of all, managed the team who provided the healthcare services and then moved into general store management it all in and around central London that was really exciting and uh, very different profiles when you're working in the city to the West End and then large store management so I think probably the biggest team we had was about I had was about 400 and it was when we introduced Sunday trading and extended hours and when retail really went through a huge uh, seismic shift, the one before the internet <laughs> and omnichannel, I just discovered that I was absolutely fascinated in what motivated people and working as part of a team and leading a team. And I think from there, I sort of just developed that in all the other roles that followed on yeah so this is really interesting kind of as as we all do it's it's the common language right we talk about store managers and, and that sort of piece but then heard you talking about you really interested in understand people and, and leading so I guess it's question 101 normally on most leadership and management training right what does management mean what is what does leadership mean but having had the experiences you've you've had what do those two words and, and disciplines mean to you leadership and management I think I have to dig deep because as you've alluded to there are so many definitions around aren't there that it's almost easy to think about people in jungles hacking things or standing on a, a tall tree and looking where you're hacking to <laughs> Having done a very hands-on management role, and especially in this sort of, if you imagine the pressure of working in a pharmacy where you've got huge pressure to keep people safe and do the right thing, an accurate thing, it's like a pressure cooker every day. You sort of cut your teeth, really having to understand how to collaborate and cooperate and how to motivate people to work as a team. So I think there's a little bit, there's definitely in both of them, you would hope that there's a team element and how to create a high functioning team amongst a group of disparate individuals who are brought together for a joint task with different motivations and different skills and stuff going on in their lives. So that was a real baptism of fire. And I think what I learned from that is that there's an element of task. Yeah, what are we all here to do in both? But leadership really, I think, is about understanding that really you're there to make sure everybody brings their A game and comes together and, and set the vision. And so it's just sort of taking a step out of and away from the task in hand and bringing in all the context and making sure you're the one who's got the eye on the context and is making sure that we're not busy fools. Yeah, yeah. This is interesting, actually. It's just got me thinking about something. So more recently, actually, I've started to get a, a bit of a bee in my bonnet, I guess, and can quite often get on my soapbox about something. And you see quite a lot of posts on, on LinkedIn these days where it has leadership versus management. And I think the, the word versus without getting too much into semantics can be quite unhelpful because it almost suggests that one is better than the other or that we are pitting one one against the other and actually they're the two different disciplines they can be different people it can be one person using both disciplines or whatever yes but actually being in charge having responsibility for a large retail store is probably the the best example of needing both skills right because managing a large boot store I imagine there is a lot of management to, to be done like stock and inventory and all of that yeah. and you've got a big group of people that you really need to engage motivate and inspire right absolutely I couldn't put it better myself and it's a really interesting thought isn't it about it's not one or the other this sort of often a blend not even a scale possibly but just a blend if we infer that management is about more of a functional activation of activities that need to be done, then leadership might be the hearts and minds and the pace and the motivation and the fun and the spirit of, of all of it. You need both, don't you? Yeah, I think you absolutely do. And I remember speaking to a colonel from the British Army about this, and she the point she made was 
um, even within the military, there's lots of management activity. And um, I forget who said it. It might have been what Peter Drucker quote said: "You you manage things and you lead lead people." But Colonel Woodbridge's point was even that management activity needs to be led. We need to energize and inspire people when we're dealing with the more of the management tasks and, and, and process. Otherwise, people still become disengaged. So, yeah, it's absolutely about kind of both, isn't it, and being clear about what, what mode do we need to, to step into. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought. and very flexible between. Coincidentally, my son's in the army and he will talk about admin as being the things you have to make sure are done and the discipline to have them done in good, good admin. I'm sure there's that's also related to the management of things because there is an element isn't there that you you can't you couldn't leave something that leads something that's broken you know there has to be an operating hub doesn't there it's a little bit um yeah. like moving house and thinking well to function having just moved it's very real we've got to be able to eat wash sleep all that stuff but then the spirit of the how and the why and the quality of life you get from it i think comes with that that leadership thing. And I think there's also an, an element of probably both of them. If we think about the term micromanagement, I think one of the things I've come to understand and believe is that teams of people, it's not always how you would do it, but what you really want to do is help understand how people do it for the best way they can do it and harness those things to the, to the common goal. Yeah, and that can be a challenge, can't it, for us as as leaders, because many times some of the jobs we're asking people who work for us to do are probably jobs that we've done ourselves in the past, or we've maybe already given it some some detailed thoughts. So it can be very easy to tell people what to do and give quite a clear suggestion about how, how to do it, which they might have a far better way of doing it and approaching the task than, than we have, right? Certainly if we've stuck to that old cliche of sort of hiring people who are way way smarter than you so why why would we be too prescriptive about how to do something and it becomes quite demotivating for people as well doesn't it we end up thinking well if you're going to tell me what to do and how to do it why don't you just get on and do it yourself yeah yeah yes you're right and sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't does it exactly. yeah i can remember having my um hand slap literally in you know, I haven't thought about being in a pharmacy for so long and I'm now <laughs> right back in there today. If you imagine when you take your meds away, you have like a little paper bag typically, which has got like a little sort of gusset base and they come flat packed. Yeah. And I can remember sort of putting some out near the dispensing station so ready to go. And one of the dispensers literally smacked my hand and went, we don't do it like that. You put them this way around so that when you grab one, the gusset bit is facing you and you can pick it off earlier. Right. And the, you know when somebody stops you in your tracks and sort of remonstrates with you, and I can remember being a little bit, and I thought, okay, I get it, right? Fall in, yeah. fall, fall in, in line. line, noted, <laughs> we'll do that again. And it really mattered to the team, and this was something that they, I was coming in, and they got this nice little sort of smooth working pattern going, and I'm like, right, my, my job is to support that noted so sometimes about leading is about following as well isn't it absolutely yeah that's really interesting actually so how has that experience do you think shaped you a leader if at all and like is, is there anything that you learned from from that that you're now mindful of when you step into a new new role as a leader or step into an M md role because it's it strikes me as being similar right we can come in as a new ceo or managing director with loads of great new what we think are great new ideas and we can start tinkering and changing things and we're, we're tinkering with stuff that people have probably spent months and months kind of working on there might be good good reasons so yeah how do you how do you approach stepping into a new new leadership role it can be an overdone strength and we'll come i'm sure we'll come on to that but one of my absolute favorite things is listening and seeking to understand and i'm pretty inquisitive which is why i really enjoy people and working with people and watching and listening to people. Having moved from a professional discipline into general management and then into other lots of other jobs, it's been so long since I've been qualified to do anything or actually do anything or know how to do anything. I spent most of my life not knowing how things are done. And therefore, I would say it's typically one of the things if you're coaching, you say to people, you know, to grow 
you've got to be able to let go and you do have to be able to work through others. If you pretty much haven't got a discipline as such, a strict discipline, you do spend a lot of time seeking to understand and then making judgments, I guess, about how to trust and therefore making assessments of how people are delivering what it is that needs delivered. And there's a qualitative and a quantitative piece to that. As I've got more into my career, I've learned to trust my gut as well, because sometimes I will have a an instinct that says to me, there's something not right here. I'm not a technical expert, but something's telling me. And pretty much if I'm respectful and I push on to find out what it is is bugging me, I tend to get there. And I think sometimes you do have to be a bit tenacious because it's easy to think, I'll listen to the experts, it's not my role. But if something's telling you that, there's usually something in it. So I think it's seeking you know, to understand, listening, starting the job and, and spending a good slug of time learning. I'm feeling really relaxed and confident that it's not about being the boss. It's about understanding what you're trying to do and who's going to do what and how you're going to do it together. Also trusting your instinct. I think there comes a time, and as I probably say, it's an overdone strength where people do look to a leader for their view and you have to be able to give it and and be confident to give it. Because sometimes if people don't understand why you just seem to question and say, okay, they'll start to think, do they not have a clue? So this is really interesting. I'd love to dig into this a, a little bit more. So one of the things that I get asked about, it crops up in leadership conversations everywhere, is how does a leader approach the situation when they're going into a role, when they are not a a functional expert, or maybe when they don't really have any idea about the technicalities of what what the team does? And therefore, how do they trust people? How do they know if what they're being told is genuine or to to use the phrase, if they're having the wall pulled over their over their eyes, that's something that people often or leaders often wrestle with. And then it's interesting that you're talking about having this gut feel. Now, a couple of years ago, I did a lot of training around around neuroscience, and gut feel came up. And I, I'd never really understood this before, but sort of the, I guess, the neuroscience of gut feel is very quickly we've registered past experience which is helping us work out something something doesn't feel right. But because it comes so quickly and that unconsciously we know something's not right and we can't, we haven't consciously thought, oh, it's this memory, it's this experience that's telling me this, that all happens unconsciously very quickly. So we have to try and sort of attach that thought or that insight somewhere, which is why we'll go, ah, I just feel it in in my gut. Now, of course, we, we don't. It's a deep deep memory from prior experience that's where where gut feel comes from so that being the case you 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 might not be able to answer this but you've said it's gut feel if you unpick it can you do you know where that gut feel is actually actually coming from is it body language you're sensing in the person that senses something's not right is it what they're saying is it how they're saying it do do you know where that gut feel is coming from Mm, i think it's a mixture of senses So I think it's your instincts and your intuition. I'm a big believer in not having to be in all the detail, but sometimes if something doesn't feel right, I will go down to seek to understand, to come back up again. And in doing that, you sometimes find at some point the person who's you're talking to or the people you're talking to reach a level of being uncomfortable and you recognize that at this you know but it could be the language they'll go well I don't really know that or Mm. I've never thought of it or start looking really uncomfortable about it and I really believe sometimes people have their truth don't they and it is their truth and sometimes they go well I don't think it doesn't actually matter and that yeah they're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes they actually don't believe it it does and they're probably doing the the best they can yeah so i think there's an element of all the senses probably you have to care otherwise you you wouldn't follow it you dismiss it you have to trust your instincts and your intuition i'm sure there's probably something going on that says other times when i've had this feeling i've it's been worth listening to so you probably have to consciously listen to yourself and then i think you have to pursue it till you're happy that you've scratched that itch for want of a better phrase 
Yeah. So it sounds like you tend to almost listen with all of your senses then from, from what I'm hearing. Absolutely. Yeah. Really seek to understand before being understood, which I think is a bit of a Stephen Covey habit. But I think it's I think it's true. And I think in starting a job, it's most people who have a new boss. And I certainly feel like that when I've had a new boss, really what you want is somebody who's interested in what you do and what value you bring. Mm. And therefore, I think it's our responsibility as a boss to be interested in a prioritized way. Yeah. And has listening always been something that you'd say you've been good at? Is it sort of innately you? Does it go back to sort of being a, a child where you're always very inquisitive and a good listener? Or is it something along your career journey you've realized is important and you've put more focus and, and attention on it? I think I have become consciously competent at it through feedback from other people who have said, you listen, because I think it's probably innate. And I'm sure I'm the same as all of us. We only, I'm sure there's a percentage, isn't there? And I'm sure I'm the same as everybody else where I'm planning my answer or what I think about it and only part listening. But to the best of I can, I think it also comes with caring and being respectful because I actually do, I, I really do care what other people think and do and say. And I don't believe I always know the answer or know best. And therefore, as somebody who likes expansive thinking, I'm really fascinated for somebody to bring a different view. And therefore, why would I close off to what I knew when somebody else might have something better to bring? So therefore, I would seek to understand that. Do you find it gets harder to listen with a truly open mind sort of the more senior you become, the more experienced you become in, in, in leadership. I guess there is a tendency to think, I've been here before, I've got similar experience, last time we did this. Do you think that's the case? Are you, are you conscious of, of that? Do you have to sort of actively check yourself and go, oh, hang on, what else might be going on here? Yes, I think ego can come into it. And I think that's really quite dangerous because I think we've all got an ego where we have real assertions about certain things and it might be our values or things that we hold really um, on high ground and I think it can that can be quite dangerous because I think it can make you shut off or judgmental to other people who maybe don't have the same views I think learning that is quite liberating because you have to watch yourself and catch yourself on and and sort of think hang on a minute just because I see the world like that doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong we're allowed to be different so I have to filter. I think I have to have, stop having limiting beliefs as well, because sometimes, as you say, if something's happened nine times and then the tenth, you'll go, well, we know what's going to happen here. But, you know, that's just a conscious self-awareness, isn't it? And I also think it can have a overdone strength that I've sometimes had people say, well, I don't really know what you think. You know, you seem to be very accommodating. And I've realised that sometimes it's important to hear, but also to voice your opinion as well. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I've noticed that as a bit of a, a theme over the past probably three to four years with some of the, the leadership teams I've, I've worked with. And I might have mentioned this on another episode of the show recently, but when I've been doing what I call diagnostics with team members, getting to, to know them, finding out kind of how the team's operating, what's going well, what's, what's not going so well. One of the common themes I started to hear was members of the leadership team would say things like, ah, Philip is really, really collaborative as a leader. But you know what? Sometimes I just wish you'd make the decision and give us the give us the, the direction. I think probably because collaboration, inclusivity, these sorts of things have been spoken about a lot in leadership management probably over the past 10 years. Mm. It's almost on a spectrum. Some leaders seem to have shifted so far to this. Everything's got to be collaborative. We've got to really have strong consensus on on everything we've sort of gone too far and some people are screaming out saying look we're happy if sometimes you just make the call and say we're going right follow follow me so again it's that balance isn't it I think so much of leadership seems to be a, a balance to, to me yes yes that's a great yeah, balance is a great thing isn't it I think I've also realized that you kind of got to watch yourself also that it's not this is going to sound really awful but 
that it's not being manipulative isn't because there was a sort of I can remember years ago learning the competence of impact and influence and sometimes it was understanding the motivate of others and you know it's like selling isn't it and the sort of yeah. you know leading people to think it was their idea and that they'd buy into it now that's a situation that can be a situation like you you described as a leader you can really easily do that it's like um a game of tennis isn't it and then you've got your little drop shot and it's very comfy and you sort of deploy it where you need to do you can have some things like that that are just unconsciously what you can bring out and things are fine as long as you don't only do that aren't they you've got to have the full repertoire and I think I've really learned to gain confidence in a phrase I had some amazing coaching with a management coach Matt Bradley and one of the things he really taught me was that it's it's fine to have people meet you in the middle you don't always have to go over to their side or shouldn't expect them to come to yours but you know here's what you think let's see what you think and let's meet on that yeah that reminds me of it's one of my favorite books actually i found myself going back to it a lot lately it's a book by marshall goldsmith called what got you here won't won't get you there and he talks about i think it's 21 habits or traits that leaders can have that prevent them being successful when they when they step up and some of the ones i love he talks about this desire to to win too much almost turning every conversation every situation into a competition where where we we yes. have to win and sometimes we just don't don't have to win and sometimes as you say like meeting in the middle is is, is perfectly fine and i think he talks about you 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 know that one applies to you if even when you're playing sport with with kids or your kids you're desperately trying trying to win and it, it made me think of this moment where we had a dads v kids kind of football match and i took a really hard shot on goal and hit some nine-year-old <laughs> quite hard with the ball. I thought, I need to calm down. I'm trying to win too much here. And it's, it's not what it's all about. Um, <laughs> no, and funny you should say, Marshall, goes, my absolute, so a book I discovered a few years ago, and I think I should be on commission for, if I'm honest, is actually, um, I don't know if you've heard of the book, How Women Rise. Yes, quite a few people have uh, mentioned it on this podcast, actually. Sally Helgerson, yeah. who knew with Marshall Goatsmith, and they, he sort of said, look, there's a real angle here. And yes, I think that his book is an absolute revelation. I thought they'd been following me, actually. I thought I'd been cyber stalked and they've been watching and listening <laughs> and wrote this book <laughs> to help me address things but yeah absolutely there's some brilliant stuff in there about knowing your mind and feeling confident and being able to say what it is backing yourself yeah so maybe final question philippa before i just ask a couple of quick fire ones to finish i get the impression that from chatting to you you've either got quite a degree of sort of self awareness or you're very sort of passionate about continuing to to learn i'm just curious about that is that a very like deliberate practice for you to continue sort of growing and sort of working on yourself to use that phrase yes absolutely I think it's probably like most people who demonstrate an interest in things. I think it's something that I do find interesting, but also I do it because I want to be better. I want to improve. I want to spend my whole life being the best I can, you know, best mum, best worker. I, and it's not a competitive thing. It's a self holding myself to a high account. And it, it's absolutely not about being better than somebody else. It's an... I think ambition is the wrong word for it, but maybe it is an ambition that I personal growth and self-awareness and the strength that comes with that. I think I had a real game changer when I realised that actually facing into things is the only way you can actually grow from them. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Listening to you talk there reminds me of I, I ended up stumbling upon it just yesterday, actually. And that that's interesting. I always find it fascinating how tend to see the same things or see things that you need just at, just at the right time in, in life. it's it, it's strange and you can see something that's then relevant to our conversation today but I, I really like it I've seen it quite a few times it's the actor Matthew McConaughey's Oscar acceptance speech from from years ago and to, to paraphrase he said oh to when I was 15 somebody said to me hey Matthew who's your hero and he said ah oh, so that's a good question. I need to go away and think about that. Let me let me come back to you in a couple of days. And he went back and said to to this man, he said, "It's me in ten years' time." 
He said, because I'm, I'm chasing myself, not because I'm a hero, I'm never going to get there, but I'm, I'm chasing myself, wanting to be as good as I can be. And he said, then 10 years later, this person said, hey, 10 years on, he said, so are you a hero now? And he said, hell no, of course I'm not. He said, Who, who's your hero then? He said, it's me in 10 years' time. So I'm always chasing. Yeah. yeah. Chasing. He said, I'll never, I'll never get there, but it's always about trying to be be the best version of of me not i'm not happy with who i am yeah. just kind of striving to to be the next best version of myself which he he tells you much better than i do but it's a it's a great little oh i'll go and google that i'm going to be pondering on that one now that's fascinating yeah really powerful yeah philip a couple of quick fire questions to to ask you to finish up one of which i suspect you may have already answered but let me ask anyway what would you say is the one book that's had the most significant impact upon you i think it's going to have to be how women rise absolutely and i regularly recommend it to other women who i coach or know or uh, work with and if I think of every single really different person I've recommended to, nobody's ever come back and not said that. Yeah, brilliant. Men as well? Now, that's a really interesting question. I think the, I'm going to try recommending it to men. I think there's only one man I've recommended it to. And he got and he did the thing where he said, I've read a little bit of it. I must go back to it. Mm. But good. Oh, yes, I will. Um, I will go there. Yeah, at risk of saying the same thing, I I should get get a copy and add it to my reading list. Actually, mm. just because so many people have mentioned it now, I'm I'm, I'm curious. So I think I'll grab a copy. Yes, well, I'll I'll grab Marshall's. We'll have to do a book club. And yeah, there we I'll, go. Yeah, what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> yeah. Final quick fire question. So I love this one. Other than your smartphone, because everyone always says their smartphone. Otherwise, um, what would you say is the one item that, if it were to be lost, stolen, or broken, you would have to immediately go out and replace? So I'm not going to boil the ocean here because I think I learned this about buying gifts ages ago. My my role in life is not to solve the unmet, the most important unmet need. It's going to have to be my coffee cup. In fact, I have it with me now at all times. So I was in the states a few years ago, staying with a friend, and he said do you have a Yeti? I said, I beg your pardon. So he said, do you have a Yeti coffee cup? And I said, yeah, nice. never heard of it. So went out, Julie bought this Yeti after his recommendation. And I just love that cup. If we've got time, I'll say why, because I could bang on about this for ages. First of all, it's great because it allows you to have your favorite hot coffee with you. Secondly, it goes in the dishwasher. Every bit of it goes in the dishwasher. So the value in use is actually as good as the value of its primary purpose. Brilliant. And I set off in the car with it the other day, forgot I'd popped it on top of the car when I got in. Halfway down the road, this massive clatter, and it had bounced off the car across the road, only a scratch, because I would have been straight on to order. Every single day I use this cup and have them for years now. Yes. Brilliant. Said like a true product person. Philippa, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a fascinating conversation. It's been amazing learning about your your journey and digging into the age-old question of the differences between leadership and management. So thank you so much indeed. It's been a great conversation. I'm sure everyone listening has taken massive value from it, as, as I certainly have. So, so thank you. Thank you, Ben. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode as much as I enjoyed recording it with Philippa. For me, one of the highlights and bits that really got me thinking deeply was the conversation we had around balancing the need to collaborate with others on our team and seek input and opinion versus knowing when it's our job as the leader to take that decision ourselves because everybody is looking at us to do so. I'd love to hear what bits particularly resonated with you, though. So do drop me a line and get in touch and let me know what you thought of the episode and what stood out for you. Best way to do that is probably on LinkedIn. I'm very active and easy to find on there. Just look me up under Ben Morton Leadership. And before you go, please remember to check out the link in the show notes to my new Delegation Mastery course. As the research suggests, nine out of 10 leaders don't delegate enough. So I'd love you to help me shift that number. And in doing so, we can try and create a world where everyone can go to work inspired to give their very best whilst going home to their loved ones at the end of the day, feeling recognized for what they do 
and appreciated for who they are. And one more thing before you go, please do take a couple of minutes to rate, review and subscribe to the show. It really does make a big difference and it enables us to keep growing the show and bringing you more and more amazing guests to learn from. That's it for this episode. Thanks once again for your support. Until next time, look after yourself, look after those you've got the privilege and responsibility to lead. And until then, lead on. Lead on.